Morning. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everybody that's here today and those watching on live stream. Uh, my name is Butch Bird, and I'll be attempting to teach today, so bear with me. I'm the regular normal, the uh, Sunday school teacher at the Means Class at Baptist Union Church. And uh, we always like to start our, our class out with a prayer. And I've asked Brother Charlie Fuller if he would open us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that you've given us to come and study thy word and learn thy truth, Father. For the Bible is the truth. And Father, we just pray that you be with us as we go into this service and pray for the special service we're having next the Sunday school lesson. And Father, we just lift the ones up mentioned in the prayer list this morning. Lift them up to you, Father, for the healing, for the physical healing and the, and the healing of the soul. Father, we just pray that you grant these wishes and pray for the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. This week's lesson was written mostly by King Solomon. It's entitled, Listen to God's Wisdom. It's taken from Proverbs chapter 1. If you have a Sunday school book, it begins on page 346. Proverbs begins with a clean statement of its purpose, a clear statement of its purpose, to impart wisdom for godly living. It's, it's, a, it's one of my favorite books. It's a, I mean, it tells it like it is. It's easy to understand and easy to read. And the first few chapters are Solomon's fatherly advice to young people. Although most of the material in this section is directed toward young people, all who seek wisdom will greatly benefit from these words. This is where one can discover the source of wisdom, the value of wisdom, and the benefits of wisdom. By his request to God, King Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. So I think his words will be worth a heed to. of secular sayings are situational. In other words, the Bible Proverbs are as well, though they are more than just good advice. They are godly advice based on the crucial premise that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Keeping that prom premise in mind helps the wise wisdom helps the wise person discern when a certain course of conventional wisdom might not be the best for obeying God's laws. Knowing God yields the wisdom to decide well. And a proverb is, is a short, contense sentence, concise sentence that conveys moral truth. We'll start out, uh, it's in two sections here, uh, introducing the book and introducing wisdom. So we start out section one with introducing a book. It's Proverbs 1, 1 through 4. And it starts out with the author says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. King Solomon is mentioned by name at two other places in the book, establishing the origin of the book's contents. According to the latter verse, the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out the Proverbs of Solomon found in the, Solomon, found in the succeeding chapter. Hezekiah and his assistants may well have produced the final edition of Proverbs, probably adding Proverbs to Solomon that were not part of the earlier edition. Since Solomon produced 3,000 Proverbs, there was more than enough material to choose from. Solomon's wisdom was a gift from God. Like any spiritual gift, wisdom has to be accepted and practically and practiced regularly. So that's important there. Like, it says, like any spiritual gift, wisdom has to be accepted and practiced regularly. Though he was a wise man, the direction Solomon, Solomon's life took shows how he himself ignored the very words which he desired to guide others. Solomon married women from other nations who worshipped other gods. These women lured Solomon. These women lured Solomon into worshiping those gods. As a result. The Lord told Solomon that the impressive kingdom that David 
his father had left for him to rule would be divided after Solomon's death. And if you remember, it was divided into north, which is called Israel, and south, which is called Judah. If anything, Solomon's failure to continue to practice wisdom underscores the accuracy and soundness of what is recorded in Proverbs. So the wisest man in the world was succumbed to, to the pressure of Satan and his temptation. Verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. This verse and the next four portray in broad strokes what this collection of Proverbs intends to accomplish. To know wisdom is to recognize the best course of action for a given situation and follow through on the action. The Hebrew word translated instruction carries the idea of admonishing or correcting someone. It implies disciplining as a daily practice, not as, punish, as a punishment, a person in the correct way of living in the sight of God. So discipline is not a punishment. It's a correction. It's hard to understand sometimes, especially for kids. Words of understanding must become more than just theory or good advice. They must be personally embraced and applied in order to be of genuine value. Otherwise, they are not really perceived. So I think what that's saying is if you don't practice it, you, you don't even perceive it. Verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Instruction is repeated to emphasize its importance. The word translated wisdom, a different Hebrew word from the one previously translated this way, emphasizes discernment. In this verse, one sees the ways which godly wisdom is to manifest itself. The Hebrew word translated justice is translated elsewhere as righteousness. Judgment does not apply to only to, to an only to an ethical standard in a judicial setting. It also includes to the idea of applying good reasoning to situations that confront one daily, especially those involving others in need. Equity is closely tied, tied to this. It means treating others fairly. The same Hebrew word is translated uprightly in Psalm 75, 2. Clearly, biblical wisdom is to be demonstrated in practical ways, more than in one's academic powers. Formal education has no bearing on whether a person can attain wisdom. Read that again. It says, formal education has no bearing on whether a person can attain wisdom. I know my grandfather finished like the third or fourth grade. And he was one of the smartest men I've ever known. Uh, he, he learned to read, write, arithmetic, the basics. And uh, he had a lot of wisdom, even though he didn't have a lot of education. Moreover, Solomon's call for his readers to learn the virtues of justice judgment and equity resonates in cultures around the world regardless of religious belief or educational background. Verse 4a B and C to give subtlety to the simple to the young man knowledge and discretion I'm sorry the young man knowledge and discretion. The Hebrew word translated subtlety can have a negative connotation. In fact, one form of the Hebrew word is used of the serpent in Genesis 3.1. He was more subtle than any, than any other creature the Lord had made. But the same root can also imply a more positive quality, like being prudent. The positive nuance in what Solomon intends here. The victim of subtly is someone who lacks life, experience, and knowledge. Such a person must be teachable, willing to listen to the instruction and discipline that wisdom has to offer. So you must be open-minded and listen to what it does have to offer. The designation young man can refer to a male child or young adult. This suggests that the reason for, for ignorance is partially a matter of lack of time to have already learned. 
the usage the usage complements the frequent references to my son in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. This emphasizes on the male child, reflects the part patriarchal society of that time and the importance placed on fathers to train their sons. Though the son is emphasized throughout Solomon's writings, the principles found throughout Proverbs are clearly valuable for both men and women. The word translated discert, discretion like subtlety can have a positive or negative meaning. Here again, the positive meaning is clearly implied. Godly wisdom will help a young person navigate a sin-infested world by learning to choose what is right and acceptable in God's sight. Okay, this is part of section two of our lesson is introducing wisdom. And it explains it as a divine force. Verse seven. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, that's one of the most quoted verses in the Bible, I think, and I've heard it a lot in my life. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That says a whole lot. This here explains it as following. Additional descriptions of the wise person, Proverbs 1 5. Solomon reveals that the key to obtaining knowledge is the fear of the Lord. The word fear covers a broad range of mindsets in the Old Testament, from simple respect to awe to sheer terror. In the context of this passage, it means primarily to acknowledge and submit to the Lord as the source of true knowledge and wisdom. If one is not grounded in that understanding of the Lord, knowledge and wisdom will remain foreign to that person. Let me read that again. If one is not grounded in that understanding of the Lord, knowledge and wisdom will remain foreign to that person. As long as an individual possesses the fear of the Lord, he or she is on the path to wisdom. Wisdom comes from many places. It is thought especially from the minds of people who have spent their lives thinking. Yet the rejection of fear of the Lord is as the basis for knowledge and the God and of God who is the source of wisdom is precisely the cause of the strife, turmoil, and disorder that mark current society. To ignore wisdom is to embark on the path of the fool. Such individuals demonstrate their contempt for God and his instruction. In general, foolish people can expect to experience unnecessary trials. You know, that says a lot right there. Foolish people can expect to experience unnecessary trials. Verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Well, what does that mean? That, this, this explains that as meaning some have suggested that the term son in Proverbs should be interpreted as a discipline or suit, as in the phrase son of the prophet. However, the context supports translating this word in familiar terms instead of educational. Both father and mother are instrumental in teaching wisdom to their children. The consequences of not hearing or of forsaking the instruction and law taught with the parents will be discipline and potential disaster. The consequences of not hearing or of forsaking the instruction of law taught by the parents will be will be discipline and potential disaster. So I think, you know, if you don't do what your parents tell you, you know, there's, there's going to, it's almost disaster. <laughs> Especially, uh, you know, if your parents were distant people. And verse number 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Peer pressure has been around for all of human history. The behavior of friends can influence one's behavior often in a negative way. The son's resisting invitations from sinners 
or save the young man much trouble. They are not just out to participate in some good-natured fun. Rather, they clearly want to harm. They want to do harm to someone to lay wait for blood. An extended plea from the father or his son, shun these wicked people to follow. Danger awaits not for the innocent victim of the sinner's plan, but for the perpetrator themselves. They are the ones who lay wait for their own blood. And I know all of us have probably our parents have told us you shouldn't hang out with so-and-so they'll get you in trouble and there's a lot of truth in that a lot of truth peer pressure has always been a tough thing and still is powerful outreach is in verse 20 and 21 wisdom crieth without she uttereth her voice in the streets she crieth in the chief place of concord in the openings of the gates in the city she uttered her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. And that's, uh, whereas the father has been the one who issues warnings to his son to this point, now wisdom itself is pictured as appealing to anyone who will listen. Wisdom will be described with the pronoun she, perhaps in part because the Hebrew word for wisdom is a feminine noun. That's, a, that's interesting. The Hebrew word for wisdom is a feminine noun. More importantly, wisdom's personification as a woman may also reflect the fact that the students are young men. By contrast, folly is portrayed as a loose woman who tempts men to their ruin. One must not overlook the places where the voice of wisdom seeks an audience. Wisdom is out in the streets where the life is lived each day, making her appeal. The place of concourse appears to describe any location that is busy with lots of people moving about. The gates of a city are where business is often conducted and where key decisions or announcements occur. Wisdom's words are desperately needed everywhere, portraying her in the city emphasizes that she is calling as many people as possible to follow in her way, rejecting foolish acts. Excuse me a second. Wisdom calls for, for people to arrange their priorities, to, re to reorient their entire value system. Instead of being simple ones and scorners who mock wisdom's invitation, they are challenged to embrace knowledge. Proverbs 1, 23-31 includes a warning of the high price one will pay for continuing to scorn knowledge. The time will come when those who have done so will desire wisdom's assistance. But, by then, they will have already reaped the consequences of their contempt. It's got a little excerpt here uh, called Speaker's Corner. It says, Do you have something to say? Have you ever wanted to stand up in public and tell an audience exactly what you think? I think we've all done that. The image of someone standing in public to proclaim a message boldly is nothing new. Solomon described wisdom as doing that very thing. What does wisdom call you to do to proclaim, to proclaim publicly? Verse 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. The rejection of wisdom's call is a decision that results in major impact on one's life. Choosing to turn away from wisdom is fatal combination of slay and destroy conveys the great violence that awaits those who reject wisdom's call. In context, prosperity suggests being at ease, being secure because of one's situation, especially financially. Let me read that again. In context, prosperity suggests being at ease or feeling secure because of one's situation, especially financially. 
there is a complacency or smugness that gives a, the foolish person a false sense of security. So if you're, uh, you know, you've, you've got a good job and you're making good money, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't don't forget, you know, who gave that to you. And don't be complacent or smug because it can be taken away in a heartbeat. Verse 33, But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear or evil. This chapter closes with a statement of the blessings that follow from heeding wisdom's invitation. Safety comes because of the wise person who has chosen to ignore foolish and sinful voices that offer invitations to pursue their path of wrongdoing. The Hebrew word translated evil can be used in a moral sense, but in some cases it refers to the harm that is one of the consequences of living in a world under the curse of sin. God, of course, does no more does no moral evil. He does, however, judge justly and bring judgment. Unfortunately, judgment can be perceived as evil by those who experience it. So, judgment itself is not evil. It's how you see <coughs> which side you stand on. It's, it, if you're on the wrong side, then you may consider it as evil. The wise do not need to fear the harm that often comes to those who live by the sinner's code. True, the wise or godly person may be the target of the ungodly and may suffer from them or suffer other types of harm than of this fallen world. But fear of such an outcome does not trouble or overwhelm the godly person. Instead, like any wise person, he or she is grounded in and guided by the fear of the Lord. And that's that's the last verse. Uh, before I get into the conclusion, does anybody have any comments or anything to say? Okay. Conclusion here says to heed warnings. What happened to Solomon? Why didn't he follow his own advice? We're thinking of Jesus' statement Physician, heal thyself. We may wish we could advise Solomon by saying, Wise man, heed your wisdom. So, you know, just because we're wise and know what we should do, sometimes the temptation is overwhelming. And it just takes us in. Can what happened to Solomon happen to us? Certainly. We will not be tempted as Solomon was by the benefits of lifestyle, the lifestyles of 700 spouses. Can you imagine that? Yeah. 700 spouses? Plus concubines. Plus concubines, right. Yeah. He, wasn't, he wasn't very wise when it came. He was very wise when it came to sin to the flesh. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 700 spouses and goodness knows how many concubines. We should view Solomon with compassion, not criticism. Anyone's spiritual failures, whether we read about them in the Bible or see them reported in the media, should humble us. You know, we shouldn't judge people. That's the last thing we want to do, be critical or judge people. Paul's warning to the Corinthians contains its own words of wisdom. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. That's, that's good word. You know, Solomon, uh, my memory serves me, the Lord came to Solomon in a dream, more or less asking what he would like to have. So, and Solomon, instead of asking for riches, fame, or anything like that, asked for wisdom. Yeah, and uh, this impressed the Lord so much that he not only gave him wisdom, he gave him riches, and made him a king. Because, you know, Solomon wasn't David's first choice as king. I can't remember the fellow's name was, but uh, he wasn't his first choice. But he did end up as king. Well, I finished up a little early. <laughs> and uh, we'll have a closing prayer. I've asked Jim Stark if he will close us in prayer. <coughs> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time to come together and study your word. 
Lord, we would ask for that spirit of discernment that we might be able to distinguish between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. We just thank you for our time together. We just pray that you will come with us through the further exercise of this service and the services to follow. And everything that's said and done will be in accordance with your will. This we ask in your name. Thank you, Thank you all for listening. Burn with me. Yeah.